Good afternoon. I'm Dan kurtz -Phelan. I'm the editor of Foreign Affairs. Later this year, Foreign Affairs will turn 100 years old, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to the first in a series of events that we're doing to celebrate our birthday. And I cannot think of a more fitting kickoff guest than the current Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, especially since he is also a Foreign Affairs author, nor can I think of a more interesting time in recent history to be having this conversation or to be in his position. That is underscored by the fact that we have rescheduled this event twice. The first time it was planned uh, was for February 24th, and we all know uh, what happened that day. The second time, the secretary ended up going to Ukraine. So um, given the uh, the global tumult at the moment, I won't spend any more time on introduction, just so we can be sure that no, no global crisis pulls the secretary away before we get into the conversation. Um, he's going to say a few words before we go to questions, first from me, then from foreign affairs readers and council members. Uh, Mr. Secretary, a huge thank you for doing this, especially at such an intense moment in history. Over to you. Uh, Dan, thank you very much. Thanks for bringing us together for this conversation. Let me thank Sam as well for um, uh, convening us. And uh, it's great to be virtually, at least, with everyone uh, at the Council um, and all the readers of Foreign Affairs, which uh, I include myself in. Uh, in fact, we have one huge problem, which is despite the virtual world that we live in, I continue to get foreign affairs in hard copy. This presents something of a challenge when it comes to shelf space, because over the many decades that I've been a subscriber, it builds up. But uh, we're trying to figure that out. Um, as Dan said, we planned to have this conversation some months ago. And indeed, February 24th was uh, the original date. Uh, and we all know what happened on that date. Uh, and then, as Dan said, the second time we did it, I wound up going to Ukraine. So I have to admit to you, when I woke up this morning, I was wondering what was actually going to happen <laughs> in the uh, intervening hours. So I'm really glad that thus far, at least, nothing has, and we can have this conversation today. Um, I want to uh, thank you for bearing with me as we get this, uh, as we got this uh, get together back on the books. But I'm glad we were finally able to do it. Uh, and in fact, the world has changed quite a bit in the few months that um, have passed since the original date we planned to get together. So before turning to uh, conversation with Dan, turning to questions, let me just say a couple of words at first. First, I really am delighted to be able to help kick off the 100th anniversary celebration for foreign affairs. Um, the ideas, the analysis that I've been privileged, like so many of you, to, uh, to read and take in over, over many years in that distinctive blue cover um, have literally helped generations of scholars, generations of practitioners, leaders, foreign policy makers of one kind or another, citizens, wrap their minds around the most complex issues of, uh, of the day. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote in Foreign Affairs about the global consequences of racism and colonialism. George Kennan, need I say more, uh, if you go back and look at the um, infamous X long telegram, um, you will see remarkably passages in it that sound like they could have been written today. Um, foreign Affairs foresaw a number of the trends that are actually defining our lives today more broadly. Uh, we went back and looked at a number of uh, issues over the years. Back in 2005, so um, some time ago when some of us were still literally using internet cafes to check our email, this magazine predicted the rise of all kinds of internet um, enabled projects. Uh, many of us, uh, I think, may have read that at the time and not been able to foresee what foreign affairs did. Now we've got cars with Wi-Fi and refrigerators that give us weather reports. Well, foreign affairs was on it early. Back in May, uh, June of 2001, I was privileged to appear in the pages of foreign affairs. The piece that I wrote then was uh, titled The False Crisis Over the Atlantic. And the case it made was that the interests of Europe and the United States were fundamentally aligned, whatever the differences of the day. Uh, and despite at that period in time, a lot of fears of us growing apart. So here we are 21 years later, Europe and the United States are standing and acting together in the face of a very real crisis. And I would argue that not just in that, in that crisis, but beyond it, we are more aligned than we've been uh, in, uh, in many years. So let me say a few words about Ukraine, Russia, uh, and then we can get to a conversation. Um, the aggression that we're seeing from Russia has provoked uh, an extraordinary response in Ukrainians who are fighting violently to defend um, their country, to defend their people, to defend their independence. 
they are first and foremost responsible for the success they've had thus far in repelling the Russian aggression. Um, but it's also fair to say that the strong support that they've received from the United States and from many other countries around the world, security assistance, humanitarian assistance, economic assistance, has also been a difference maker. And we're doing that and, of course, keeping uh, and even building pressure on Russia to uh, end its aggression. Uh, today, as many of you will have seen, um, President Biden announced a significant new security assistance package for Ukraine to help give the Ukrainians what they need now to deal with the particular nature of the challenge that they face now in southern and eastern Ukraine. Uh, and this will enable them to better defend their territory against the Russian onslaught. We're also continuing to work with partners to try to address um, the crises that Putin's aggression in Ukraine have helped exacerbate uh, or even provoke. Number one on the top of the list is a food security crisis that we're seeing around the world. Already pre-existing conditions, climate, COVID, and now you add conflict. Um, this has had a profound effect on the ability of a lot of food to get out of what has been a breadbasket for the world, Ukraine, as well as Russia itself for that matter, causing prices to spike in places where food actually is available, uh, causing uh, shortages in places where it is uh, harder to get at. So we're working very hard on that. I'm happy to come back to that when we, when we have a conversation. But let me just say this, even as the <clears throat> excuse me, brutal fighting continues, we already see that President Putin has failed to achieve his broader strategic objectives. Instead of erasing Ukraine's independence, he strengthened it. Uh, instead of asserting Russia's strength, he's undermined it. Instead of dividing uh, and uh, weakening the uh, international order, he's actually brought countries closer together to defend it. Uh, you all know this very well. This war is not just about Ukraine, even though its principal victims are, of course, Ukrainians. It is an assault as well on the fundamental principles of a rules-based international order, a phrase that we throw, throw around a lot, particularly on 68th Street, but uh, one that really still has meaning. And we find increase, has meaning for countries around the world. They know that these rules, these norms, these standards, these basic principles that we established many, many years ago to try to preserve peace and security actually have been relatively effective in doing that for all of the challenges we've had in matching our ideals to practical realities. And they see these rules as being under assault by Russia and Ukraine as well. Finally, let me just add a word on China and then we'll, we'll have a conversation. Even as we're doing everything we can to stand up for Ukraine's security, for its democracy, for its independence, we will resolutely remain focused on other challenges that we face uh, around the world, starting with what we see is the most serious long-term challenge to that rules-based order, uh, and that's the challenge posed by the People's Republic of China. Um, I gave a talk on China last week. Uh, in it, uh, I said that China is the only country with both the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the ability to do so economically, dipl diplomatically, militarily, technologically. It's also an integral part, of course, of the global economy. Uh, it's critical to our ability to solve big global challenges from COVID to, to climate. So you put all that together and that makes it for us the most consequential and complex relationship of any we have in the world. Simply put, we're gonna to have to be dealing with each other for years and years to come. The question is how most effectively to do that in terms of our interests uh, and our values. One of the things that we um, uh, believe strongly, and this has been a debate and discussion going on for many years, in Washington, in New York, and in other places. Uh, but where, where we now land is that we can't uh, rely on Beijing to change its own trajectory. Uh, what we can do, and what we're working to do, is to shape the strategic environment around Beijing to advance our positive vision for an open, inclusive international system. Um, as I described last week, summing it up, our plan is focused on three things. Uh, invest, align, compete. Invest in ourselves, something we've gotten away from over many decades. Align with our allies and partners because our collective weight together has a much greater impact than any of our countries acting alone. When we're dealing with some uh, action or conduct by China that uh, we find objectionable, it's one thing when the United States takes it on alone as 20, 25% of world GDP. It's another one we're aligned with partners and allies and maybe it's 50 or 60% of world GDP. And then finally compete uh, with China to defend our interests and build our vision for uh, the future. At the same time, as we tried to make clear, we still see uh, important areas of cooperation and we'll pursue those wherever we can. 
Last piece is this. Um, I've got a really uh, hackneyed acronym that my colleagues here at State are sick of hearing me say, um, and it's ROW, RO, rest of world. Beyond China, uh, beyond the crisis uh, in Ukraine, uh, we're determined to row, to keep the focus on the rest of the world, to make sure that American diplomacy is engaged in trying to make things just a little bit better, a little bit more peaceful, uh, a little bit uh, more hopeful, uh, a little bit more prosperous, uh, a little safer for our own citizens. So whether it's COVID, whether it's climate, whether it's dealing with crises and conflict from Ethiopia to, to Yemen, uh, we're engaged, we're doing that. That's what our diplomacy uh, is all about. Um, and that's what President Biden asked us to do. He wanted to make sure that even as we reasserted uh, our engagement in the world, that we led with our diplomacy. And that's exactly what we're, we're trying to do. So let me, let me stop there. Uh, and uh, Dan, back over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your kind words about the magazine. And we'll look forward to getting your, your byline back in at, at, at some point when you have time. Um, let, let me start with Ukraine and especially the question of how we define success in U.S. policy. And, and I mean that in two regards. First, on the ground, you know, the, the clear and insistent message from the administration is, as the president put it in his op-ed yesterday, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. Does that mean that if the Ukrainians are ready to keep oh. fighting, we go back to February 23rd lines, the United States is prepared to keep up our support militarily and economically um, until until they've achieved what they want to achieve on the battlefield, or if they say we want to go back to, to 2013 lines, even with regards to Crimea, will we continue that support? And then second, with regard to, to Russia, you, know, you, you talked about the ways in which Russia has been weakened. The administration has talked about the need to deliver Russia strategic defeat. Can you say more about what that looks like? How in a successful scenario from the U.S. perspective will Russia and Russian power look after this war uh, from, from the way it looked at the beginning? Sure, and those are, uh, I think those are great bookend questions because they, in fact, go, go together. A few things. First, when it comes to Ukraine, uh, from my perspective, uh, we uh, cannot and will not be less Ukrainian than the Ukrainians. We're also not gonna be more Ukrainian than the Ukrainians. And fundamentally, where this ends up uh, really needs to be a decision by the Ukrainians, a decision that, uh, that we'll support. But broadly speaking, and this goes to the second part of your question, here's what we see as, um, principles uh, to, uh, to guide us as we're working through this. Um, first, whatever happens, we wanna make sure that uh, we end up with a Ukraine that is independent, sovereign, and has the capacity to defend itself and, and ideally deter any future aggressions from Russia or from, from anyone else. That's one. Second, um, Russia should have a, a lesser ability to repeat this exercise in the future. So some of the measures that we've taken, uh, including the export controls, which are having a significant impact and will have a growing impact on Russia's ability, for example, to modernize uh, its defense sector. Uh, those will, um, as I say, have, a, have an impact over time and, and make it maybe a little less likely that Russia does this in the future, as well as Ukraine's ability to really have uh, a strong deterrence, something that we can do something about going forward. Um, third, we wanna make sure that our NATO alliance uh, is doing what is necessary to shore up its own defense and, and deterrence. We've made a very good start of that over in, in, in recent months. We have a NATO summit coming up where we'll take that additional steps forward. Um, <clears throat> and finally, two other things. I think we want to make sure that we use this uh, aggression uh, as an opportunity also to um, help Europeans as they move away from decades-long dependence on Russia for, for energy. We're seeing that start in a very significant way in ways we haven't seen before. Uh, we'd uh, like to con uh, see that continue and we're taking steps to, um, uh, to, to help. Finally, moving beyond Europe, uh, it's important that um, China take the right lessons from this. And I think what China has seen thus far, at least, is countries coming together in unprecedented ways uh, to make sure that uh, we are supporting Ukraine and in terms of uh, providing it what it needs to defend itself, to deal with its economic situation, to deal with the humanitarian crisis, that we're exerting extraordinary pressure, unprecedented pressure uh, on Russia. Uh, and as I said, that we're also making sure that our own defenses uh, and deterrence are built up. Um, China's looking at this very, very closely, very carefully. We wanna make sure that it takes away the right lessons. 
But fundamentally, Dan, where this actually ends up tactically on the battlefield, um, where lines are drawn, we are looking to, to Ukraine to decide that. We will continue to support them to make sure that they have what they need to deal with Russian aggression now, and also that they have the strongest possible hand to play at a negotiating table if and when it emerges. I believe one eventually will. Most of these things end uh, in some fashion diplomatically. I hope that that's sooner rather than later. Unfortunately, the signs we're seeing right now don't suggest that Russia is prepared to engage in a meaningful way in diplomacy. Okay. You, you, you mentioned the assistance package uh, that the president announced yesterday. And one piece of that was multiple launch rocket systems the Ukrainians had been pressing for publicly and I presume privately as well for some time. This was the latest instance of what seems to be an intense and careful effort by you and your colleagues to weigh on the one hand the risks of escalation between the United States and Russia and NATO and Russia, and, and on the other hand, uh, the need to give the Ukrainians uh, what they say they need and what we assess they need to fight effectively on the battlefield. In, in the case of the rocket systems, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov had, of course, warned that this would be, uh, quote, a serious step toward unacceptable escalation. That was a warning that the administration evidently discounted. But can you can you talk through a bit how you assess that 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 process, how you make that calculation, and and why in this case you, despite that warning from the Russians, decided that this was a step the United States should take? First, as a Broad, a matter of broad principle. Our objective, of course, is to help uh, the Ukrainians bring this aggression to an end, not to expand it, not to widen it, uh, whether in Ukraine or beyond. President Biden's been clear about from, the, from, from day one. Um, something else the president's been very clear about from day one, including directly with President Putin, and that is exactly what we would do in the event that Russia uh, pursued the aggression that it was threatening and that we saw coming many, many months ago. And he had conversations with President Putin well before the uh, aggression began, uh, to just be very clear with them about what to expect, what to expect in terms of our support for Ukraine, including with security assistance, as well as economic and humanitarian assistance that that proved necessary, what to expect in terms of the massive consequences that would befall Russia if it pursued the aggression, what to expect in terms of NATO strengthening its own defenses. So we have not been uh, hiding the ball on that. There, there, in a sense, have been no surprises. All of this was made clear to uh, President Putin well in advance in an effort to deter him from uh, proceeding with the aggression. Tragically, uh, he went ahead anyway. Um, and then, Dan, all along, we have tried to make sure that what we are providing to the Ukrainians, as well as what others are providing, uh, meet the moment. And that, that is um, the equipment we provide is what they need to deal with what Russia is actually uh, doing. So for example, what was provided to the Ukrainians in the initial stages of the, uh, of the aggression, particularly in defense of Kyiv, uh, with things like stingers and javelins, really answered the moment. And by the way, that's not something that started on February 24th or February 25th. It actually goes back uh, to last Labor Day, when the president did an initial drawdown package. Another very significant drawdown package, as we call them, this is the release of articles that our Defense Department has at, at, at hand. Another very significant one uh, at Christmas, so well before February 24th. And then of course, since February 24th, we're now on our 11th uh, package. Um, but each of these is tailored to meet the moment. As the conflict has changed, as it's moved to uh, away from Kyiv because of the extraordinary courage of Ukrainians, but armed with what they needed to push the, uh, the Russians back, as this has moved to the South and East, the nature of the conflict has changed. Um, and one of the things that um, is, is necessary, and we have heard from the Ukrainians on this, uh, was the need for some longer range artillery because the Russians uh, were now in a, in a position where their supply lines were shorter because all of this is much closer uh, to Russia. Uh, they controlled before February 24th, a chunk of the Donbass. They could use that to position uh, their forces and position their equipment and then fire things at relatively long, long range at the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians had to have some way at getting back at that uh, and not, um, not simply being under fire from the Russians. So the systems that are being provided now are designed to help them do that. But it was also important uh, to us that uh, we get assurances from, uh, from Ukraine that this equipment would not be used to uh, attack Russia in Russia. Because as I said at the start, we don't seek to escalate this conflict. Uh, we're trying to bring it to a close, but bring it to a close in a way 
uh, that uh, defends the um, uh, principles at stake and defends Ukraine's independence uh, and sovereignty. So that's how we've been uh, how we've been looking at this. And again, uh, I I think um, whatever uh, the Russians say, we've been very clear from the start about what we were going to do, and we're doing it. We could, of course, keep going on, on Ukraine all afternoon, but let me keep your, your row caution in mind and, and turn to a different subject. You mentioned the speech you gave on, on China last week, and I'd urge anyone who hasn't, hasn't listened or, re- or, or read the speech uh, to go and do so, because it really is the most uh, uh, substantial statement of U.S. strategy on China uh, that's been made in some months. But I want to I focus on one, one dimension of, of our strategy and our policy. Now, you stressed in that speech that we don't seek to block China from becoming strong, from becoming a, a major power. And yet you also made clear that uh, Beijing's vision of and approach to global order is, is not acceptable from our, from our perspective. The rejoinder from Chinese analysts and policymakers is that this is what they always hear from American officials that, you know, we welcome your strength, but everything you do with that strength, we find objectionable. So I'm wondering if you can say a bit about what the appropriate role for a strong China is. You know, are there ways in which the rules-based order of the international system uh, can and should change to accommodate that strength? What, what, what do you see a strong China doing? Hmm. So a few things on this. Um, it really is worth repeating and reiterating. We are not seeking to block China. We're not uh, seeking to keep China down. As I said uh, in the speech, we're certainly not looking for conflict and we're not looking for a new Cold War. Um, but the profound difference is this. I believe China wants a world order, which is good because order is, is usually better than the alternative. Uh, but the profound difference is this. The order that we've sought to build, it, very imperfectly, but that we sought to build is profoundly liberal in nature. The order that China seeks is illiberal. We disagree. And it's, as, and it's as basic and fundamental as that. And so to the extent that China is taking steps that would undermine the liberal in the broadest sense of the term uh, nature uh, of the order, we're going to, uh, we're going to oppose that. Um, and again, we've been, we've been clear about that. Where there's, no, there's no secret to it. Um, on issue after issue, a China that is acting in a positive, productive way uh, should be a major contributor to dealing with um, the problems that, that the world faces, from COVID to climate, uh, non-proliferation. Uh, I could go down the list, and we will continue to seek uh, it, its uh, cooperation, its coordination uh, on that. Just a couple, just a week ago, um, ten days ago, we had the presidency of the UN Security Council this past month in May. We used it to focus on the growing global food insecurity crisis that we're dealing with, a product uh, of, um, as I said, of COVID, uh, of climate, and now of conflict, because the Russian aggression in Ukraine is denying uh, so much wheat uh, and other grains to the world market, blockaded uh, in uh, Ukrainian ports by the Russians. Um, We've sought uh, to work with China on that. In fact, we invited them to take part in the ministerial meeting that we had on the food crisis. Uh, Regrettably, they chose not uh, not to join, but the door is open. Um, China has a tremendous ability uh, to use um, its, uh, its power, its influence uh, to, to productive ends. And again, we would welcome that. On, on COVID, it is vital going forward, even as we're trying to bring COVID to, to an end, uh, that we build a stronger, uh, more effective, more agile global health security system that includes um, better real-time exchange of information, uh, access uh, for, uh, uh, for experts, uh, the ability to um, see some kind of pathogen uh, emerging uh, and to be able to do something about it. Uh, China could be a major uh, player in that. I hope that it, that it would be. So, you know, and these and so many other issues, obviously non-proliferation when it comes to North Korea, when it comes to Iran, uh, China has a major uh, role to play. Um, but ultimately, uh, Dan, this is what I come back to. We can't decide for China. We don't pr- purport to do that. Um, we can't uh, uh, compel it to do X, Y, or Z. Uh, It's going to make its own decisions. What we can do is shape the environment in which it makes those decisions. Uh, And that's what the strategy that we put forward is all about, particularly when it comes to aligning with allies and partners. And there, I have to say, we have seen in the 15 months or so that we've been in office, a growing convergence in attitudes toward uh, toward China, toward the challenge that it represents. Um, Because some of the things that we're concerned about uh, were, not, were not unique 
uh, there are shared concerns, shared grievances. And the more we're able to, as we say, align with other countries in dealing with them, the more effective we're going to be. Because again, if it's an economic matter, for example, if we're 20 or 25% of world GDP, well, that's one thing for China to have to contend with. If we're aligned with uh, European partners, with Asian partners, um, it may be 50 or 60% of world GDP. That's a very different matter. It's something that China has to take seriously. Let me go to one other other row topic, and that is um, Saudi Arabia and, and, and whether or not the president, in fact, goes uh, later this month, as has been reported, there's certainly been a surprising degree of progress in the relationship, given uh, the administration statements about um, about the crown prince and about the the, the state of U.S. Saudi relations early on in, in uh, after Inauguration Day. If the president does go, do you expect to see uh, progress from Saudi on some of the human rights concerns that that you expressed and the administration expressed early on? Do you expect to see certain steps taken to end the war in Yemen um, as a, a, a part of that trip? Or is the need to open the oil spigots and the possibility of steps towards normalization with Israel uh, sufficient reason enough for the president to go? Dan, when we uh, uh, came in, uh, President Biden was determined that we recalibrate the relationship with, with Saudi Arabia. Uh, and to make sure that it, that relationship was serving our own interests uh, as well as our values as we move forward, but also uh, preserving it because uh, it also helps us accomplish many uh, important things, which I'll come to in a second. And that's largely what we've done. Uh, of course, we had the, uh, the murder of uh, Mr. Khashoggi. That was something that um, we and so many others around the world uh, took very, very seriously. One of the things that we did uh, early on uh, and that I did uh, at the president's direction was of course to release our own report uh, on his murder. Um, I wouldn't underscore the, I wouldn't underestimate the, the significance of that uh, because having that report out with the imprimatur of the United States government, um, I think has, um, has real meaning. At the same time, we initiated the, uh, the so-called Khashoggi ban to make sure that uh, any country that seeks to use uh, tools of uh, repression against people abroad who are criticizing in one way or another, uh, the government would, um, would pay a price for that. And we've actually used it uh, multiple times uh, since. At the same time, we thought it was very important to uh, engage Saudi Arabia uh, to deal with people's lives going forward uh, and uh, to make sure that we were doing everything possible uh, to um, help um, secure those lives. Yemen uh, was one of the most important places that we wanted to do that. And what we've seen as a result of our uh, work with Saudi Arabia, as well as with the UAE, and of course with the United Nations uh, and some other countries, is real progress in actually dealing with one of the worst conflicts the world has seen over the last decade. Uh, we helped achieve the first truce uh, in eight years in Yemen, just, uh, just a couple of months ago. I'm hopeful that that truce is now going to be extended. We'll see what happens over the next um, couple of days. But a, as a result of that, uh, we have more humanitarian assistance moving to uh, different parts of, um, uh, of Yemen. We have, um, in effect, uh, a, uh, the guns uh, relatively silenced, which means that people are not being killed uh, and injured. Uh, we have attacks against Saudi Arabia uh, that have ceased. And by the way, there are 70,000 Americans in Saudi Arabia. So not only do we have a commitment to defend Saudi Arabia as a, as a partner, but we also have the interests of Americans to, to look out for. And we have the possibility, however fragile, of moving toward a more enduring peace in, uh, in Yemen. Again, that's part of the, uh, the recalibration of the relationship. And uh, we uh, applaud the work that Saudi Arabia has done to try to move this forward. At the same time, uh, we're engaging constantly, uh, including me and my own conversations with uh, my Saudi counterparts. Uh, on human rights uh, in Saudi Arabia itself, including individual cases, uh, as well as more systemic uh, issues. Saudi Arabia is a critical partner uh, to us in dealing with um, extremism in the region, in dealing with the challenges posed by Iran, uh, and also I hope uh, in continuing the process of building relationships uh, between Israel and its, um, and its neighbors, both near and, uh, and, and, and further away, uh, through uh, the continuation the expansion of the Abraham Accords. So all of that is critical. And yes, energy, of course, is a critical piece to this too. Uh, we want to make sure that there are sufficient supplies of energy on world markets at a time when this is being increasingly challenged. 
Um, and uh, we want to make sure that, that prices are held in check so that uh, consumers don't suffer. And Saudi Arabia is a, a critical player. The point I'm making in a long, long way is we want to make sure that through the relationship, we are addressing the totality uh, of our interests in, um, uh, in that relationship. And yes, that goes to values and it goes to human rights and democracy. It also goes to uh, other interests that we have that are necessary for the well-being of the American people. Uh, we're trying to put all of that together and take a comprehensive approach uh, to, uh, to Saudi Arabia, as we do uh, with any other country. But um, I think you've seen over the last uh, 15 months or so uh, um, a more effective recalibration that is making sure that our interests uh, are, uh, are front and center. Um, I'm going to ask you a very quick, uh, more personal question while Sam prepares questions from uh, members and, and readers. You've worked for at least two secretaries of state in the past. You've observed many more in your, your various jobs over the last uh, couple of decades. What has surprised you about being in the actual chair? What, what are the challenges that you did not anticipate or fully appreciate when you were a, you were a staffer? So, you know, when I first started working for, uh, for President Biden, when he was in the, um, uh, in the Senate, he was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, Dan, I started with him uh, back in, uh, in 2002, and the job I held then was um, staff director for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And when I started, someone told me very presciently, you know, there are two words in your title of staff director, only one of them counts, and it's not director. So, you know, like anyone who's been in, um, uh, in staff jobs for many, many years, making the, the transition uh, in and of itself is kind of interesting, but I, I've got to say, it just gives you a greater appreciation for what those you've uh, worked for and worked with for many years um, have, to, uh, have to engage in uh, every day. Because ultimately, in any institution, the buck stops somewhere. Uh, in this institution, the State Department, it stops with me. There's a much bigger buck that stops at the desk of the president. Uh, but uh, that's a responsibility that, uh, that I feel, that I feel strongly, and that is much more acute by actually sitting in the chair for however long uh, uh, I'm in it. Um, so I'd say that's probably the most important thing. Now, having said that, I had one huge benefit coming into this job, which is I got to spend uh, two years as John Kerry's deputy during the Obama administration. And so watching him, seeing how he uh, did the job up close virtually every single day, as well as, of course, having had the opportunity to work in different ways with Secretary Clinton, Secretary Albright, but also to be inspired by, to read about uh, people like Jim Baker, uh, like George Schultz, uh, and to and, and Colin Powell, who I considered uh, a, a friend and a tremendous source of advice over many years, all of that just made a, a huge difference. But like anything, you can be familiar with something uh, academically, you can be familiar with, with, with it by seeing it up close. It's always a little bit different when you're actually doing it. Okay. Uh, well, I will resist the temptation to ask follow-up questions. And uh, Sam, let's go to uh, uh, some of the questions from uh, folks on the line. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder to ask a question, please type in your name and question in the fields below and click submit. As a reminder, this meeting is on the record. Our first question is from Bonnie Glazer who asks, are you concerned about possible Chinese efforts to provide material support to the Russian economy, either legally or illegally, as Russia's economy weakens as a result of international sanctions? Um, Bonnie, in short, the, the answer is yes, and it's something that um, President Biden brought up directly with President Xi when they spoke um, by video conference uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, as the, This was just when the Russian aggression started. We had warned our Chinese counterparts for, for some weeks that this was uh, likely and indeed going to happen. Uh, I think they were surprised, uh, if not by Russia taking some action, certainly by the extent of that action. Uh, and one of the things that President Biden said to President Xi is we would look um, very unkindly at the prospect of uh, China providing material support to Russia, either on the military side or taking steps that, for example, undercut the uh, sanctions that we, would, we were compelled to impose uh, on Russia as a result of its aggression uh, in Ukraine. I have to say, thus far, we have not seen from China any uh, systematic effort to help Russia evade sanctions, nor have we seen any significant military support um, from China to Russia. On the other hand, the so-called no limits partnership that um, President Xi and, and President Putin um, signaled just weeks before the Russian aggression, we certainly see aspects of that 
continuing, particularly uh, uh, China continuing to advance uh, Russia's efforts um, politically and diplomatically, um, parroting some of the Russian propaganda, uh, even amplifying it. Um, I think that's deeply unfortunate. And ultimately, uh, I think it really risks um, doing damage to China's reputation. Um, China will have to make its own calculations about that. One of the things that President Biden noted for President Xi when they spoke um, after the, some weeks after the aggression was this remarkable um, exodus of companies from, from Russia as a result of the, the aggression. Uh, seven, 800 companies, the leading brands from around the world who didn't want their reputations to be at risk uh, by doing business in Russia. And of course, doing business in Russia was also made more complicated by the sanctions, but the sanctions themselves didn't drive this exodus. It was really com companies deciding on their own that they were not going to do business as usual in a country that was committing this kind of aggression. Uh, that's something I think that China also ha has to factor in as it thinks about its relationship with Russia, what support it does provide, as well as thinking about um, uh, its own policies going forward uh, in, um, in its more immediate neighborhood. Sam, let's go to the next question. Our next question is from Anthony Richter, who asks, this month, the UN Security Council must decide whether to renew the travel ban on Taliban leadership. Given a steady stream of Taliban decisions negatively affecting the rights of Afghan women, how will the U.S. approach this critical vote? Thank you. So with the Taliban takeover, uh, a few things happened at the, same, at the same time. One of those was a UN Security Council resolution setting out the expectations of the international community for the Taliban uh, in, in Afghanistan. Those included, uh, among other things, an expectation that it would continue to um, provide for freedom of travel so that people, uh, if they so choose, could leave the country, that it would uh, not countenance terrorism emanating uh, from Afghanistan and would take steps to, um, uh, to deal with it, uh, and uh, that it would uphold the rights, the basic rights of Afghans, including uh, women and girls. What we've seen in um, uh, recent months uh, has been, uh, I think, a, a serious reverse gear on women and girls in particular. Uh, we've seen uh, the uh, lack of access to education for girls above the, uh, the sixth grade. Uh, we've seen uh, various requirements, uh, including uh, the imposition of wearing, uh, wearing a veil on, uh, on women and then penalizing uh, their husbands or fathers if they, if they fail to do so. Uh, we've seen other restrictions on their ability uh, to get an education, uh, to work, uh, to engage in society, uh, including, for example, even uh, commentators on, uh, on television. So all of this goes uh, directly counter to the expectations of the international community that are in a UN Security Council resolution. Uh, they also go against the expectations of the, the community that were expressed in um, many statements that uh, the, United States, the United States helped initiate, including with over 100 signatories on, uh, on one of these statements at the time of the Taliban takeover. And what that says is that we've been very clear with the Taliban that to the extent they seek to have more normal relations with any country, including the United States, uh, we have expectations that they will live up to commitments that they themselves made, as well as, as I said, the expectations expressed by the international community. So we'll see what happens in the, um, uh, in the next couple of weeks. But I think uh, the international community at large, the United States in particular, has been very clear about what we're looking for uh, from the Taliban and to the extent that they uh, are not uh, making good on those expectations and those commitments, that will have a real impact on uh, the extent to which their relations with uh, the rest of the world can be normalized in any way. As a follow-up on that, have the escalating warnings or fears of a, a worsening humanitarian crisis and food crisis in Afghanistan changed our, our assessment of how to approach these questions at all? Yeah, and I'd say two things on that. First, even as we've made clear what our expectations are, uh, and, and by the way, other expectations included access for humanitarian uh, workers and humanitarian assistance, as well as a um, more inclusive and representative government. Um, two things on this. We believe that whatever the profound differences we have uh, with the Taliban and uh, however they are falling and clearly falling short of uh, the expectations that we've set and others have set 
it's usually important that we do everything we can to make sure that humanitarian assistance gets to people in need in Afghanistan. We remain the leading provider of humanitarian assistance. We've worked very hard to make sure that that assistance could get to where it's needed and that humanitarian organizations could function uh, effectively in Afghanistan. They're in the lead in, uh, in doing that, but we want to make sure that to the extent we, we can support that, we are. That includes, for example, uh, issuing multiple licenses just to make crystal clear uh, to countries and institutions around the world that the sanctions that remain in place uh, are not um, designed in any way to block the provision of humanitarian assistance. The second piece of this is, is, is broader, and it goes to the question of the relationship between what we're doing on humanitarian assistance and more broadly, what can be done so that irrespective of anything else, Afghanistan has a basically functioning economy so that people have um, a little bit of money in their pockets and can provide what they need for themselves. Um, and whether it's a teacher, whether it's a humanitarian aid worker, whether it's a doctor, potentially whether it's even a civil servant, there has to be a basically functioning economy. And we've been looking very hard at ways to do that that are not a direct benefit to the Taliban, but that can bring benefits to the, uh, to the people. Uh, and that's something we're, we're working on very actively. Sam, let's get in one more quick question. Our last question is from Emerita Torres, who asks, Secretary Blinken, I believe your plan to modernize U.S. diplomacy is critical, including getting more Americans at home aware and involved in policy. How will the State Department's institutional structure and practices change to facilitate this effort? Thank you. And uh, I, I really appreciate the question because it is um, something of real, uh, real focus for me. And that is a modernization agenda that we put out um, some months ago. And you know, the story with these things is, is often the same. Uh, secretaries come and go. Uh, they all have reform plans. They all seek in one way or another to change the department. We tried to be inspired by a lot of work that had already been done. And a, a lot of it has been done, including, by the way, by the council in various reports about how to make this department more, even more effective, more agile, more responsive to the needs of the American people, mm -hmm. and more reflective of the country that we represent. We took those, that work to heart. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking to our own people uh, about those questions. Um, and of course, we consulted with, uh, with Congress because there's been a lot of good work done there over the years in thinking about how to strengthen the department. And all of that came together in a modernization agenda that time doesn't allow me to get into, but basically we're focused on a few core things. Instead of having 97 priorities, we've really just got uh, a handful. Uh, one of those is making sure, for example, that uh, our people have um, the, the tools in hand to do their jobs effectively in the 21st century. So we have a, a modernization agenda that goes to technology, but also goes to flexibility uh, in the workplace. That, by the way, also makes sure that we can attract the best talent going forward because we're in a competition for that talent uh, with um, other parts of government, with the private sector. We wanna make sure that what we have on offer is going to bring people um, into the department. We've focused um, our efforts as well on critical issues um, that have not necessarily been uh, the things the department has been known for in the past, but that are actually critical to the well-being of uh, Americans going forward, like climate, like global health, uh, like economics, and of course, like dealing in the cyber and, and digital world. We just stood up a new bureau uh, for um, cybersecurity and, uh, and, and digital policy. We, we got that done in record time with strong support from Congress. Uh, we're going to have uh, senior envoy in office to deal with emerging technology. At the same time, we're working on strengthening what we, uh, what we do on global health. Uh, and of course, we have John Kerry who's been leading our efforts uh, on, on climate. We're also building up everything that we do on, uh, on economics because these are the things that are front and center, and, and center that actually have an impact on American lives. And the department needs to be in a place where it's attracting talent in those areas. Again, areas that have not been necessarily right in the forefront of what we're uh, uh, known for and seem to be doing and that we generate uh, talent, including in the way people are trained uh, throughout their careers. Uh, and then finally, let me say this, it's vitally important that we have a department that actually reflects the country that we represent. And this is not simply because, and it is the right thing to do. It is certainly not um, an act of charity. It's, it's fundamentally because it's the smart and necessary thing to do. Um, we're operating in, to state the obvious, an extraordinarily diverse world. And the comparative advantage that we bring to the table is having one of, if not the most diverse countries on earth. 
the idea that we would not bring uh, the fullness of that diversity into the work we do at the department makes no sense. It shortchanges us in the world. It shortchanges our foreign policy. Uh, the ability to bring these different perspectives and experiences to bear that uh, may give unique insights into how uh, a diverse world is operating and affecting our interests, it would be a huge mistake uh, to leave that um, uh, off the playing field. At the same time, as we're grappling with problems, uh, whatever they are, uh, having that diversity of perspectives, opinion, experience, it's gonna come up uh, with, with a better solution. So we've been um, engaged in a, in a very significant effort to really and genuinely um, make sure we have a department that looks like, uh, looks like America. We appointed the first chief diversity and inclusion officer in the department's history. She and her team report directly to me. Uh, we have senior officials in every bureau responsible uh, for this portfolio. Uh, we have a strategic plan that'll be, that'll be coming out very shortly, a five-year plan uh, on how to do this. And uh, part of that is actually starting at the very beginning of the pipeline, make, reaching out and engaging with communities that are underrepresented in the department and kind of opening their eyes and minds to the prospect of serving in government and hopefully serving at the State Department. Um, we now have, for the first time, paid internships. And that, uh, in terms of the socioeconomic impact they'll have, on broadening the aperture uh, to bring people in at the outset of their careers to test out whether they might wanna come here, that's going to have, I think, a significant impact. There's a lot to be said on this, but um, you know, I commend uh, to those who are interested uh, what we put out on the modernization agenda, but we're determined that uh, you know, by the time we're done here, uh, we have a department that is even more responsive to the needs of uh, the American people. Last thing I'll say is this, none of this is flipping a light switch. It is turning an aircraft carrier. It takes time, it takes sustained effort, and it's not gonna be done in two years uh, or three years. But my hope is that um, as we're doing these things, uh, we are helping the culture evolve in the department. And we're also creating an ongoing demand signal from everyone here uh, that will continue uh, through the next administration and the administration beyond that. That is a great note to end on. Secretary Blinken, a huge thank you for joining us and helping us kick off uh, what will be a series heading uh, into the fall. And I will look forward to welcoming all of you back uh, for subsequent events in, uh, in the next few months. And again, Mr. Secretary, a huge thank you and best of luck in these intense months ahead. Dan, thank you very much. And I really uh, was glad to be able to join everyone today. And uh, let me just close by saying, we continue to look to, uh, to be inspired by, to rely on uh, the pages of foreign affairs. Um, the number of times that, you know, I've read something there that has sparked a, an idea, um, helped create an initiative, uh, given, <laughs> given me a good argument uh, and uh, very constructive criticism, uh, I can't even count them. This is so vital to what we do. It's vital to our democracy. It's vital to our conduct of foreign policy. So. All I can say is this, it's great to celebrate uh, these 100 years, but even more important are the next 100 years. And I'm just grateful that we're all joined in this, in this journey together. Uh, so thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you to everyone who contributes to foreign affairs, to everyone who edits it, to everyone who reads it. We will hope to uh, persuade you to create some more room on your, your bookshelves for future issues. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Thanks all for joining. Have a good afternoon. Thanks very much.